Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Lauri Tankler, and I represent the um, National Cybersecurity Center at the Information System Authority. There's a whole lot of different acronyms that uh, we have, NCCs and um, R&D, uh, coordination, all those kinds of things. Um, when I was uh, thinking about the, uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about, um, uh, I thought of maybe we should be starting to, maybe I should just, you know, boast about all those things that we do at the Cybersecurity, National Cybersecurity Center, how we've, we've educated, um, we're, we're worked out a program for girls, uh, how we, we, we think about this workforce and everything like that. But... I want to actually, you know, step back a little bit, uh, just to say uh, that that I um, I set this whole uh, presentation up in a different way, just to talk to you a little bit about, you know, what's actually going on in cybersecurity in Estonia, because this is what we do at the Information System Authority at the National Cybersecurity Center. We uh, take a look at what's the actual. Uh, actual things that are happening in the cybersecurity uh, domain, and uh, then we tailor our responses uh, according to what's actually happening. So let me just give you an overview of what's been happening in 2023. Um, the Information System Authority in Estonia, we do two things. Uh, we build systems uh, that are the underlying architecture of the Estonian uh, information systems, so such as the electronic identity, the X road, all those kinds of things. And then the other side, the uh, cybersecurity center, we protect it. So we do a whole lot of things uh, concerning uh, analysis. Uh, we uh, have the uh, computer emergency response team, CERT EE, um, standards, all those kind of things. So we build it and we protect it. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, on this slide saying that how we do this, uh, so handling cyber incidents and supervision and defense of critical infrastructure, this protected part is where we uh, work. So let's just give you an overview of what's been happening and to you know talk about what's the trends in 2023, we gotta go back and compare it to something. So let's compare it to 2022. In 2022, we um, we put out this. Um, no, at the beginning of 23, we put out a a, uh, a yearly assessment saying that the 2022 was a year of denial of service attacks. All right, you can read all about it on Ria's website, uh, and uh, there are some of these. Um, what's been happening in 2023 uh, monthly quarterly and annual overviews uh, on our website. You can you know, find them uh, pretty easily. So if 2022 was a year of denial of service attacks, and I don't need to you know, tell this crowd about what is a denial of service attack, I uh, suspect, then 23, what's been happening? We have had a whole lot of denial of service attacks. Um, these are just some of the headlines that we've seen subject to bigger waves and bigger waves of denial of service attacks. This is just one, uh, just another um, example of uh, something that's been interrupting our daily lives, our systems that we rely on. I mean, the trains were running. That's, you know, that's actually a good thing. But the ticket systems were were disrupted. And this is something that that uh, may look uh, or feel like a minor nuisance, but it's actually, you know, just uh, um, demonstrates how reliant we may be on some of these systems uh, online, that I'm not sure that if there's ever a possibility to buy a paper ticket anymore, I'm not sure that there is. But this little passage from one of these uh, one of these um, uh, articles sums it up pretty well. Uh, one of our experts uh, actually said that, uh, you know, um, uh, this is most of these attacks are denial of service attacks. Um, but the, and for example, one of the, you know, targets was also uh, the North Estonian Medical Center. 
Um, and uh, the last sentence is something that you know I want to uh, I want you to pay attention to. The hospital's work was not affected by that incident. So that's the same thing with the trains. The trains were running. The hospital was working. But we are under a constant barrage of uh, denial of service attacks. That's just a fact of 2023 as well, like it was in 2022. What else has been going on in 2023? So um, there's uh, we have this uh, um, English language in English language as well a quarterly uh, overview of uh, of what's uh, what we at RIA have been seeing. Uh, in Estonia, and uh, I'm just going to bring out a couple of headlines uh, from that quarterly assessment. So this is a global wave of ransomware that also affected Estonia. And um, in it, it says that the attackers were exploiting a two-year-old vulnerability in, in some software to actually gain access to some of these or organizations and to uh, deploy the ransomware uh, there. Um, another from the second quarter, um, we did uh, notify a whole lot of uh, online uh, web stores about uh, uh, the fact that they had um, uh, outdated software which was vulnerable. Um, and um, there were still a whole lot of uh, online stores after this Magento uh, software was, was uh, uh, basically obsolete. Uh, they were still using it, so that's it. Um, there is a segment which we call "It could be better," uh, and then we we learned in April that there was a big data leak. Uh, why uh, a a lot of things were stolen due to unpatched security weaknesses, unpatched security weaknesses, and again some defacement attacks. We were talking about. Um, in the third quarter, um, because you know website defacements. Why did they happen? It's mostly because of outdated software or unpatched uh, unpatched systems. These four headlines or pieces of news, they have one thing in common, and it's patching. It's vulnerabilities and patching. Um, our, the previous speaker also talked about like this constant uh, uh, this uh, cybersecurity challenge where uh, the vulnerabilities are there more and more all the time, um, and we are falling behind in patching them. And uh, we need maybe also some cybersecurity automation to help us out there because. You know, there are some of these uh, vulnerabilities or patching systems or updating systems, uh, things that may catch us off guard. Like maybe something was is being found yesterday or today and we have no idea that somebody was exploiting that. But let me just go back a little, a little, and let's just put this out there again. Attackers started exploiting a what now? A two-year-old vulnerability. A two-year-old vulnerability. We're not talking about stuff that was actually discovered yesterday or today, but the attackers started exploiting a two-year-old vulnerability and they actually got through. So this is not a problem for, you know, this is not acute in that sense that I need to run now. But in two years, it could be actually, you know, it should be patched or updated. Two years. Right. So uh, these are some of the things that uh, next to the denial of service attacks, we're seeing a lot of things that are happening due to unpatched uh, vulnerabilities or software that's not being updated. Globally. We're looking at some of those uh, bigger trends as well, uh, and we see them in Estonia. We, uh, I did say something about ransomware in Estonia, uh, but uh, this is a good graph which uh, shows how much ransomware operators have been uh, bringing in money. This is a trend. Uh, the red line 
is uh, year 2022. And uh, a dark blue line or black line is 2023 up to, you know, half a year. Um, and uh, the numbers on the left there are millions of dollars. That's basically half a billion of dollars of revenue that's been recorded to have been gone to um, ransomware operators in half a year only. This is a global trend. And we do see ransomware uh, happening in Estonia as well. I mean, of course, you can't get half a billion dollars from Estonia. It's, that would be really difficult to actually get here. But uh, this is a trend that is global and it is big. Now think about this for a second. Uh, if this goes on the same way, it could go up to about, you know, like nine, a hundred million dollars for the year. Okay, let's think about this. When we look at the next slide, this is for 2022. It's from uh, the FBI. Uh, that's actually showing you, uh, showing uh, what are some of the losses that I, they have recorded. And the first two that are up there are in billions of dollars, 3.3 billion and 2.7 billion. The first one is investment. This is something that we at the Cybersecurity Center, we don't really, um, this is more about uh, scams. This is more uh, police work than what we do. But the second one is called business email compromise. And uh, of course, I have to say that this, these are, you know, American numbers, uh, which are always bigger. But uh, but these uh, these numbers actually demonstrate the difference between between the actual losses uh, that are are recorded uh, all around the world. So business email compromise, obviously, when you um, when somebody's email is being uh, uh, surveyed, somebody has uh, given access to their emails, and at the final moment where money exchanges hands, then the attacker asks them to redirect the payment to another uh, bank account. This is business email compromise. This is an even bigger deal in the world compared to ransomware. Sure, the ransomware has a little uh, asterisk uh, on, on here. It only says $34 million. It's because ransomware losses aren't really reported to the FBI, and that was in that report. So, you know, let's, you know, put half billion actually there as well. So business email compromise in terms of technical things is a global thing, and it's growing as well. And this is also something that we have seen in Estonia. We've seen a lot of business email compromise, and it actually does have higher monetary losses compared to ransomware. That's one of the, uh, that's 100,000 euros in Estonia. And there's a big uh, question mark here, because the direct victims were not at the Estonian company, it was their partner, but it was the Estonian company that was compromised. That's why the partner was, uh, um, the, that the partner got this email, hey, uh, can you send that 100,000 euros to another? And yes, the ransomware, like I said, this happens here as well. So on the technical side, yes, we are looking at the denial of service attacks. We're looking at vulnerabilities and patching, and some of these um, uh, ransomware and some of these uh, business email compromise uh, attacks, they start with phishing, uh, very simple things. Somebody asks you, what's your password? And you tell them your password, and then they get access to your emails, and then they get access to your systems. So these are the technical things that are important to note when we're talking about what are the trends and challenges here. One more thing though, we're talking about also policy. And the policy um, is, uh, is a tricky one because you know, you know, what is a trend or a challenge here in policy? Um, the NIS2 
is a regulation that will be will have to come into force on October 18th uh, in 2024. That's uh, a little less than a year from now. This actually means that a whole lot more of organizations in Estonia, in all of your, your countries and everybody's countries who's watching us on online uh, in Europe will have to have uh, mandatory uh, required uh, uh, sets of... Um, uh, cybersecurity measures in place. Right now, this applies to, uh, for example, in Estonia, it applies to operators of critical services and um, and uh, public administration. In uh, in next year, a lot of different organizations, this scope will be expanded. Uh, this is a picture from Ernst & Young, which uh, demonstrates that, you know, if now we're talking about that banking and energy and drinking water and health sector have to have these, uh, these mandatory requirements, then next year there will be manufacturing, waste management, food production, uh, digital providers, wastewater. These sectors will have mandatory requirements. There's a couple of things, you know, you can look it up. This is from the actual uh, regulation that they have to have um, appropriate, proportionate, technical and operational and organizational measures put in place. Why am I talking about this as a trend or a challenge? This means that these organizations will have to have people who know all these things. Or they will reach out to cybersecurity service providers so that they could actually provide these organizational, technical, operational measures uh, to those uh, companies. There is another thing here. You don't have to read the whole thing. So the, the, uh, the members of the management bodies of these wastewater management and all those kinds of things, they will have to follow training, the required training. So they will, they will have to acquire services to train these people. This is a trend or a challenge for next year. So what are the implications? Why am I talking about these trends and challenges to a forum of educators and cybersecurity education um, enthusiasts? Let's just put it this way. It's because these all, all these things that I've talked about today require skills and education. We're talking about, you know, basic cyber hygiene skills, of course, you know, like that you don't click on everything that you, uh, that you see out there, that you can update your software uh, on this, uh, maybe your smart TV or what was it, the, the cat camera that somebody earlier uh, mentioned, that, that they wouldn't be uh, DDoSing the hospital that is providing care for our people. Technical skills and cybersecurity training for you and for these people who work in these sectors uh, that they would actually do the same. But the skills and education part, and we're talking about higher education as well, also demonstrates to us that there will be more risk management people needed, standards and compliance people needed, and leadership and organizational skills people, you know, people who actually um, lead these companies, who finance the, these companies, who who look for investments, who look for 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 actual, uh, or they allocate funds to do these things. These people will have to know about cybersecurity in the next year. This is why I'm bringing out these trends and challenges right now. So I'm going to stop here. Um, you obviously, if you have questions, I'm ready to answer them, but. This is why, why we talk about these trends and challenges. We look at them every day at RIA. We, we see these problems and we see these things coming up and we actually need these to be addressed by people 
also by you know new automated innovation software but but this is something that i want to leave you with that these are the skills that are needed like right now like next year so thank you very much i'm ready for your questions Uh, thank you, Laurie. And uh, again, I encourage also all of you to ask questions. If you don't want to do that over Slido, we do also have microphones here so that you can just raise the hand and also ask your question. I know that Estonians are very shy in the beginning, but uh, OK, we already have one hand. Uh, we already have one hand, so let's take that one here uh, for that channel there. Yeah, the microphone is just coming. Uh, thank you. Um, so one of the emphasis is one of the problems or one of the challenges we have is a lot of this cybersecurity stuff is coming from, in many cases, the, the military. Now, there's a huge difference between policing cyberspace and uh, cyber warfare. And I'm always quite amazed at how that the, the police, the military, don't understand that policing. So how much communication do you have with the Estonia police? Okay. Thank you for this question. Um, first of all, just to you know, like put this into our perspective, we see that the, you know, most of these cybersecurity incidents come from the civilian side. You know, this is the the, the biggest side here, and you will hear about the military side right after uh, right after my presentation here. But we do have Ria. We do have a lot of uh, communication with the Estonian police. And uh, the Estonian, uh, the, the, the police and border guard board, they actually uh, have uh, these, um, uh, they have two different sides. One is, is tackling the, uh, the, the more difficult and more cybersecurity like oriented uh, questions. But then, you know, the regular police, the regular police, they actually are focusing more and more on how to protect, how to prevent some of these maybe investment scams and all those kinds of things. We do um, share information with them and they share information with us. We've set up some automatic information sharing. And, uh, and I think that, you know, like in terms of prevention, uh, awareness campaigns and all those things, we uh, we try to make it uh, so that that we are you know in lockstep when we're talking to the general public about how to address some of these issues which are affecting the general population as well so there is a lot of uh, cooperation uh, there oh, so yeah they're not here today maybe maybe they're watching <laughs> online but uh, yeah so yeah uh, any other questions from the audience before I'm going to jump to my question? Any hands that I can see? I can see the lights. No. Okay, so you can still uh, take some time for uh, <laughs> not being too shy. So, um, so you were talking about the talent. And I think this is something that I always uh, raise that question is like also in a previous presentation, we are messing around 4 million people working in cyber in a world. I, I think the numbers in Estonia are also like pretty big. So so more if we think about uh, expectations, we have a lot of people here also from the uh, universities, for example, like the research institutions and, and even like the high school teachers. Uh, what are your expectations for, for these people uh, in, in the educational field, like what they should be doing? Can we help them? Is there any way to do collaboration? Is there any good examples maybe that mm -hmm. we can solve that problem together? Because I feel like uh, when we think about especially like education sector there is a lot of also uh teachers who don't have the skills to kind of help our kids mm -hmm. what should we do in order to overcome that issue as well okay thank you for that question <laughs> um because we do have a, a talent show going right downstairs <laughs> basically that uh, that uh, people are demonstrating how well they're doing but uh, uh to to sum it up uh we need like uh quantity quantity Basically, this is what we're looking for. It's not just about the actual, the best of the best that we're looking for. We're looking for also people who are just, you know, like uh, good at some things, but they don't maybe want to compete. It doesn't matter if you compete in cybersecurity as long as you can do the good work. Like if you can protect that hospital, if you can mm -hmm. protect your, your, your critical infrastructure, if you can protect your country, then 
it doesn't have to be that that you had have won a competition somewhere. You have to actually, you know, like be there uh, to actually help out or contribute. So what we're looking for is um, uh, is a little bit more speed, uh, is a little bit more uh, agility in terms of what uh, higher education, but also what you know, like um, uh, you know, basic education can do, so that we could interests uh, a whole lot of uh, new people, the new generation in cybersecurity. Uh, we're looking for a little bit more diversity because we see that very few women and girls are involved in these technical uh, places as well. And so I know that the academic sector and the education sector has always found a way to, to adapt to organ, you know, like societal changes. Like if there's more cars out there, they will, you know, put more engineers out there. You know, it's always there. Right now, we're a little bit of a in a hurry. So we need some things to actually change a little bit faster, a little bit more, a little bit, you know, quantity. This is something that we're looking for. Thank All you. Right. Um, is there any, any other questions so far from the, from the audience that you want to address before I let uh, Laura to actually go from here? No. Okay, um, then I, I would like thank to you. say a very big thank you to you.